morning, Cedar Meldoret. Amen. This side is really nice. I'm just wondering if anyone is awake here. Good morning, Sita Meldoret. Amen. The Lord bless you. We are on the subject of the church and politics. Uh, this is not going to be a political sermon. It will definitely inspire some of you to think about what the Lord wants to do through your life in a political space. But you will discover very quickly that uh, whether you have the title politician or not, we all live political lives. And you'll see in a, a few short moments. We're in lesson or study number seven in the study material. Um, and we're going to look at the text that has been given to us for that particular uh, study today. And that's Jeremiah chapter 29. We're going to read 14 verses, verses one through 14 and then go into our text for the church as a participant. The church as a participant. Now, when you hear that title, you often think, and I'm just buying time so that some of you can find Jeremiah. In the, it's in the Old Testament. If you're in the New Testament, you're on the wrong side of the Bible. The title suggests that the church or this conglomerate body has a role to play in politics, which to a degree is true, but at the end of the day, the church is us. So we have a personal and particular role to play with respect to politics. So tell your neighbor, you could be a politician. That neighbor was not very convinced by that, so find another neighbor and tell them, you could be a politician. At the very least, you would be a participant. If you have Jeremiah verse 29, please say amen and let's read uh, this text. I heard one amen. This is the text of the letter the prophet Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders among the, el uh, the exiles uh, and to the priests, the prophets, and all the other people Nebuchadnezzar had carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. This was after King Jehoiachin and the Queen Mother, the court officials and leaders of Judah and Jerusalem, the skilled workers, artisans, had gone into exile from Jerusalem. He entrusted the letter to Elassah, the son of Shephan, and to Gemariah, the son of Hilkiah, uh, whom Zedekiah, the king of Judah, had sent to King Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon. And it said from verse four, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says to all those carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons. Give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters increase in number and do not decrease. Also seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it pros prospers, you too will prosper. Yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says, do not let the prophets and the design diviners among you uh, deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. And verse 10 says, this is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to you to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, verse 11, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me. And when you seek me with all your heart, I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have banished you, declares the Lord, and bring you back to the place from where I carried you into exile. 
This <clears throat> particular text, the beginning of chapter 29, shares with us four things that I'd like us to take very seriously this morning, and particularly as we go into uh, this tail end of the um, campaign period, getting ready for elections. There are about 60-something days to go. But as we do so, we want to be hearing God speak to us. And this is exactly what the prophet is preparing us to do in chapter 29. We see this, and just to paint a quick picture for you, the context for this is that Jerusalem, the city, the capital city, if you will, of the kingdom of Judah, has been destroyed. And a great number of her population have been taken captive into Babylon. The northern kingdom of, uh, I, of Israel has already been taken into captivity several years before. And Judah has been holding out, hoping that they might be able to survive the onslaught of the great army from Babylon and the great power that Nebuchadnezzar had uh, represented. Unfortunately, time had come that they had not changed their ways and God brought great judgment upon all of Israel and took them into captivity for 70 years into Babylon. Now the final stroke has been uh, cast and uh, Jerusalem is now destroyed. The temple has been burned with fire. All of this is recorded in 2 Kings chapters 24 and 25. And here, Jeremiah, who has been left behind in Jerusalem, the prophet of God, a priest, in fact, in the temple, who has been prophesying for the last 20 years that God was going to judge Israel. Now, if you had a message that kept coming to you for 20 years or at least 20 days, you would pay attention to it. Amen. I had three amens over here. Let me see if I can get some amens. If you had a message that was coming to you 20 days in a row, the same message, you would want to know who sent this message and why it was important. The children of Israel, thank you for the yes. The children of Israel had ignored, in fact, they had vilified, they had uh, uh, condemned Jeremiah the priest and said that, you know, you're speaking absolute nonsense. They made him pay for telling the truth and prophesying the hard truths to Israel at that time. And now after 20 years, God's judgment has come upon Israel and they are taken, and Judah, and they are taken into captivity. This particular letter that Jeremiah writes, after being proved true, writes to the exiles and to the leaders who have been carried off into Babylon, is not only a vindication for himself, but it is a cry of attention, or attention to the things that God is trying to say to the children of Israel, regardless of their situation. Every situation that we encounter in life, good or bad, will be addressed by God directly. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Elder Philip. There is a, it is a fact. It doesn't matter what you're dealing with or, or, or going through. Uh, uh, Reverend Dr. Judy uh, admonished us about this and exhorted us as we came to a time of concluding worship, that it doesn't matter what you're dealing with or where you are, are at this particular moment. The Lord knows that. And the Lord is able to deal with that situation. And he wants to speak into that situation as he's done through this letter of uh, Jeremiah to the leaders in the captivity. Every facet of our life is addressed by God in scripture. And we are well served to attend to what he says because it is for good. Tell your neighbor God has some good things to say to you. You are not too convincing. So tell your neighbor again, God has some good things to say to you. The fact is that even in the midst of what they would consider to be the worst experience of their lives, they are now captive. They are prisoners of war in a foreign land. Everything that they held dear, the temple itself, everything about what God had done for them is in ruins. There is no home to go back to. Everything has fallen apart for them, and yet God is speaking good over their lives. Our failure to heed what God is saying in Scripture will cost us in the long run, as the children 
of Israel soon discovered by ignoring 20 years of prophecy, they paid a heavy price. The philosopher, the Greek philosopher Plato once said that the penalty that good men pay for not being interested in politics is to be governed by those who are worse than themselves. The penalty that you and I will pay for not being interested or not paying attention to what God wants us to hear regarding politics is that we will be governed by people who are worse than ourselves. So allow me to speak to us <clears throat> and into your own situation this morning, but also to speak into the social framework, the politics of the day, because God speaks to seasons as much as he speaks to his servants. If you like, you can tweet that, amen? God speaks to seasons as much as he speaks to his servants. Now, Jeremiah raises three responsibilities to the captives despite the hostile conditions in which they find themselves. And as we read this letter, we're reminded that there's a similar refrain in John chapter 17, when Jesus is praying for his disciples and praying for us as well, he prays specifically that we are not taken out of a world that is against us, but that God keeps us from the evil one, that God helps us to know the truth and to live the truth as we should. So your circumstances may not always be rosy or comfortable, but Jesus has already prayed that you will be kept from the evil one that you will not be overcome by the enemy's onslaught against us. That's good news. And it helps us to know that however difficult and whatever difficulties we go through, the Lord has already made it possible for us to survive and to thrive for his namesake and glory. So there are three responsibilities and um, <clears throat> uh, all of them start with a P. Now, last week, the pastors at CETAM um, gave us, our, our, our pastor, Judy, a hard time for the letter P in this part of the world. <laughs> it was on a light note. I am sorry that uh, all the points start with a P, but it's going to help you to remember. Three responsibilities. The first one is the responsibility to participate. Amen? Then we see that in verses 5 and 6. The second is going to be the responsibility to pray. And the third is going to be the responsibility to be patient. So we're going to talk about participating, praying, and being patient. Point number one. This letter encourages participation in the life of the captors and oppressors at the most fundamental level of our lives. Jeremiah says, build a house, build a home. Nobody builds a home unless they plan to live there for some time or unless you plan to rent it, have it used as a source of income or leave it to your children. You don't do something as permanent as building a home if you don't intend to be around for some time and if you don't intend to be a part of the community in which you live. So build houses get married, plant vineyards, have children, get those children to marry. In other words, think of the long game. Prepare for a generational participation in all that we're doing. This election is not about just 2022. In fact, we've been talking about 2022's election since 2017, if not before. The politics that you and I have to deal with is not just about this year and this coming August and this coming ninth day of August. It has everything to do with the implications for many, many years, for your children's lives, for our grandchildren's lives, because decisions made at the very highest level and even decisions made at a community level will impact generations to come. And so God says to the children of Israel, Think long game. Think generationally. Think about what your politics or your participation in this particular time in our country is going to mean for the children who will come after us. He also encourages them to increase in number. In other words, do not be outnumbered or reduced 
in your numbers or presence by the factors that are around you. And this is why, and I'm, I know Senior agrees with this, that we should be involved in evangelism even as we are involved in politics. That we, we get as many more Christians involved in the life of our nation, in the life of not just politically, but economically, in, in the marketplace, in all these things. Get, get them all involved in the life and the future of this nation because God wants us to increase and not to decrease. Amen. This makes sure that they will at some point be more of us than they will be of them. You know, I thought about this for a moment and I said to myself, it's true. The fact is, there are no Christian roads in Kenya. Amen. I mean, there may be a couple of roads that are named after people who are Christians. But you and I, if we travel to Nairobi, we're going down the same road that everyone else is going down. And, they, they, you know, there's no special highway which is nice and golden for us who follow the Lord parallel to the road that's going to Nairobi. All of us are using the same resources that everyone else is using around us. And if we show them how those resources can be used for the betterment of everyone, they're more likely to pay attention to believers. They're more likely to pay attention to the principles that you and I want to uh, to, to, to encourage. We would be preserving our heritage, ensuring that we impact our culture around us if we increase as the children of Israel were encouraged to do. And it would help us to also ensure that everyone around us would notice that there is a difference about how we approach difficult circumstances. If there's anyone who should be in a good position to illustrate and to testify to others how to go through a difficult time, it should be Christians. It, I had one good yes over here, so I'm, I'm going to work with uh, my good elder on this side. If there is any group in our society who should show what you can do by going through difficult times, it should be Christians. We are the ones who have a model in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who paid a high price in suffering, if there is any one of us who has gone through a hard time, who has had to bear burdens of our own, we have a testimony to share with the world that there is a God in heaven who knows how to bring them through, through tough times. Amen? I heard some good amens over here. I think I'll just stay on this side <laughs> of the church. That is point number one, the responsibility to participate. Everyone should know that you are a believer. Everyone should know that you're raising your children to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Everyone should know, who lives around you, should know that you are not a corrupt person and that you desire to honor God by your practice and by your example wherever you go. That's how we participate. Point number two, the responsibility to pray. In verse seven, and I'll just read that for us very quickly, just to remind us. The scripture says, seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you will prosper. Now, it's interesting that the, this, the Hebrew Bible uses the word peace and prosperity. Both of them are actually derivatives of the word shalom. And shalom is a powerful Hebrew word because it doesn't just mean be at peace or at rest. It means that all of our being should experience wholeness. We should experience complete peace in every aspect of our lives. That we shouldn't just be at peace with our neighbors. We should be at peace with ourselves. We should be at peace and, and, and whole in, our area, in the area of our financial well-being. That everything we do should have a sense of wholeness about it. That there is something different about the way in which we live. So God says, Pray for these people who have taken you into captivity. Pray for these people who have destroyed your place of worship. Pray for these people who have killed your neighbors and killed maybe some of your relatives. Pray for them and pray for their prosperity. And I'm sure some of those Israels must have said, what? Lord, what are you asking me to do? To pray for the people who have destroyed my life? to pray for those who have undermined my future, 
and perhaps have taken away every possibility of my life working. You are asking me to be gracious in my response to them and to pray for them. Effectively, God is asking us to pray that good is done to those who don't deserve it. But in doing this, he's also encouraging Israel to pray a selfish prayer. And this is how you and I can begin to engage in a selfish prayer. Because he says, if they prosper, if they experience shalom, you will experience shalom as well. You know, it's, it's like being in a prison and you're badly mistreated, you know, you're, you're not fed properly, you're not given warm clothing, your conditions are very, very poor, and you're told pray for the guards and pray for the warden that they might, you know, grow fat and rich and comfortable because as they do well, they will come take care of you. They'll change all of your circumstances. You know, if, if we had a dual carriageway from Eldoret or even from Kitale or from the border from Busia all the way to Mombasa, a dual carriageway, four lanes, nice, on one, just going the same direction, we would reduce accidents by, who knows, 80% in this country. It, more people would use that carriageway to get, to get to Mombasa than even thinking about flying. The thing is, that if we pray for the prosperity of this nation and we pray for whichever government takes over, whichever regime takes, takes uh, whichever alliance wins this election, if we pray for them to prosper, we will prosper too. Because as I said before, we don't have any Christian roads, we don't have a Christian airline. SGR does not stand for Serving God Railway. <laughs> All of that, if it is blessed, if it does well, will benefit us as well. So we must pray. We must take the responsibility to pray for good politics, for good decisions on infrastructure, good decisions on education, good decisions on healthcare, because it is our children who will go to those schools. We are the ones who want to go to those hospitals when we're unwell. When uh, Reverend Bria was in hospital, he wasn't asking, is the doctor a Christian? Is the nurse saved? He just wanted good service. Amen. And he got it because we have good infrastructure around us. Let's keep praying that God blesses the infrastructure, even if you are not a supporter of the manifestos that have been delivered to us in the last few days. Rather than condemn any of our political aspirants, especially the ones we don't support, we should pray for their success and the nation's success because it will become our success. So tell your neighbor, pray to be successful, even if it means praying for the opposition. Yeah, that didn't sound very nice to do. So tell them again, pray for the opposition. Amen. The fact is that whether you, the person you, you support, the party you support, or the party that you don't support wins this election, all of them must report to God because he's the one who calls them into office. He's the one who blesses them and tells them, this is your duty now, take care of Kenya for the next five years. And if you don't, you will answer to me. And that's all we can trust God to do for us. The fact is, as uh, Reverend Dr. Tony Evans from uh, Oakwood Community Church in the, in the state said that Jesus did not come to take sides. He came to take over. Jesus is not an Azimio follower. Jesus is not with Kenya Kwanzaa or any of the other parties that you may be thinking of. In fact, that's one of the biggest mistakes we make is we pray, Lord, help so-and-so win. Oh Lord, help this party to be successful and win a majority. Instead of praying, Lord, who do you want to take responsibility to lead this country? May they submit themselves to you. Thirdly, the responsibility to be patient. Verses 10 through 13 reveal something that perhaps the 
captives, the exiles in Babylon did not want to hear. And some of us may receive bad news on 9th of August because you don't want to hear that your candidate or the one you actually voted for did not get in. So God says, whatever happens, you're going to be here for a long time. 70 years of captivity must pass before I come back and visit you, before I come and rescue you and take you back to the, 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 the country you were taken from. Influencing political change will take time. Amen? Amen? Not too many people are interested in hearing that. Our expectations for change, ex especially for political change, are often naive. Because like the false prophets who misled the Israelites in verses 8 and 9, into thinking that captivity would never come. They always kept telling people, oh, it's not going to happen. Jeremiah is telling lies. He's prophesying falsehoods. The fact is it came, and when it came, they changed their tune. They said, oh, it's only going to last a couple of years. 18 months, tops, and you'll be out. We'll be back here. God says, no, 70 years of captivity are about to take place. And I want you to be patient. Some of you will not finish those 70 years. You know, we always pray that God will give us a, a, a Christian president or God will, will, will give us Christian leaders, etc. What if God said, um, give me the next 25 years? We would raise our hands and say, Lord, uh, Quelly, please answer this, this prayer, this prayer at least. We, don't, we can't wait for 25 years. You know, there, there are, are, are Christians, there are believers who understand this very, very well. One of them is the president, the current president of Malawi, Dr. Lazarus Chakwera. Some of you may have heard him or seen him. He's, he spoke at Jamhuri Day here in Kenya last year. Uh, and he's a believer, he's a Christian. In fact, he's not just a Christian. He served as the bishop or the general superintendent of the Assemblies of God in Malawi uh, for, oh, well over eight, eight years. He even taught, he was a, a lecturer at East Africa School of Theology right here in, in Kenya, in Nairobi, uh, for 12 years. So he, he, he's a Christian, he's a believer, he's a bishop. And the Lord spoke to him in, in 2013 that he should go into politics and he should run for the presidency of Malawi, 2013. And he told his, his fellow leaders, church leaders, this is what God was saying to him. And he said to them, the Lord had told him to go and join himself to the, uh, the equivalent of Kanu in Kenya, in Malawi. And some of you are laughing already, but uh, I know it, there was a time when Kanu was a big deal in this country. You know, nobody could wave a flag or, you know, without saying Jogo or whatever. That, that, that was, now, this particular political party was called the Malawi Congress Party, and it was the party that led Malawi to independence. Highly respected. Every leader. Unfortunately, the party is also the party that brought one party rule and a life president to the country. So it was not a very popular party especially in 2013, 2014. Most people who thought they would go into politics would start their own party or they would avoid MCP completely because this was not the party to join. And he joined this party. And of course, people thought he had made the biggest mistake of his life. How can you run for the president with a party that does not even the opposition likes? Nobody likes this party in the country. And yet, he stayed in that party. He, he became, he was elected the leader of the party. And by the grace of God, he changed that party over seven years. It took him seven years to change the party and the, 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 you know, the picture of the party, the face of the party in the nation. So that Malawi Congress Party went from a party that nobody wanted to have anything to do with to a transformed party of integrity a party that was held against uh, a corruption and a party that everyone would respect. He then ran for the presidency and lost. He ran in the second next election and he lost again. People were thinking, no, you're, you know, you're wasting your time, you're wasting our time as a believer. But he challenged the second election and he challenged it because of what had happened in Kenya in 2017. 
And the Supreme Court in Malawi decided to look at the allegations and made the decision that yes, indeed, uh, you know, some untoward things had taken place in this election and they nullified the Malawi election in 2020, uh, in 2019 and called for a second election, which Dr. Chakwera and his party won. He is now the president of Malawi. We call him, he, he used to be just bishop to those of us who know him, uh, but now he has to be His Excellency Bishop <laughs> or President Bishop. He's, he's, he's no longer just a brother in, in, the things, in the things of God, but it took time. We have a responsibility to be patient. You know, when, when, when some of our brothers and sisters say that they are running for this particular office, we have to say, you know, Lord, we trust that you've spoken to them, but if they don't get in in this election, we'll wait for the next one and we'll keep praying for them. We'll keep encouraging them. Let me wrap this up by giving us four things that we need to do because God has allowed us through, not only through this text, but through the example of, of, of our experience in the political sphere now, uh, to see four things that God does for us. And one is, uh, well, all four of them again, sorry, uh, Reverend Judy, start with a P uh, again. So having been participants, having prayed, and having now been patient, we see that God is speaking, as he speaks to the children of Israel, asks them and reminds them that he is a promise keeper. Tell your neighbor, God keeps promises. There are well over 3,000 promises in the Bible that are made directly by God to his people and ultimately to us. We can not only count on his word, but we can build our lives and our politics and our national future upon the promises of God. And you can do that for your life and your family personally as well. Because what God promises will take place. Amen? I had some good amens over here. Let me see if I get some more. What God has promised you, even if it's beyond, and especially beyond the political sphere, will happen in your life. Take the word of God to the bank and make it a part of your life. That's the first P. The second P, that God has a plan. This is one of the verses that gets quoted a lot of times out of context in Jeremiah 29, verse 11. I know the plans that I have for you. God has a plan. Tell your neighbor God has a plan for you. God has a plan and this is nothing arbitrary about dealing with God. He sees the end from the beginning. He sees everything that's going to happen in between. And more so, he supervises how successful you will be by his grace and purpose. The third thing we find is that when we learn to pray in a way that gets God's attention, we see results. You and I should start praying in this way. This is what God says about the kind of prayers that he wants us to pray. You will, verse 12, you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. There is a difference between just praying regular prayers. Lord, bless the service. Bless my children as they go to school. Lord, give me a, a, a good uh, opportunity for this job interview. Help me uh, in, 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 in my, my planting season as a farmer. We can pray all those kinds of prayers, and they're very routine. But there is a prayer of intentionality. There is a prayer that says, Lord, I'm not getting up from this place until you answer me until I feel your presence, until I know you are about to move through my life. The kind of prayers that you can't pray when you're just sitting uh, at home or driving the car, the kind of prayers that require you to be here in a prayer meeting. Amen. They need you to be here for like a Kesha, where you're kneeling on the cabro here and you're calling out to God and you're, you're saying, Lord, if you don't come and intervene in my situation, I don't know how I will, I will survive this next month or the next six months. Prayers of intentionality, because that's the kind of prayer that's going to get God's attention. He says, you will pray and seek my face and you will find me if you seek me with all your heart. And then finally, and fourthly, God has a place in mind 
for where he expects us to operate in obedient transformation and purpose. God said that I'm going to take you back to the promised land, the place that was destroyed, the place that had always said great things would happen in your life. You see, God wants to position us specifically for the task that he has called us or gifted us to fulfill. So if I can put it this way, don't try to be a politician in Rwanda if God wants you to be a politician in Kenya. Amen? Amen. Don't run for MCA in Majengo if God wants you to run for governor in Nandi. Amen. There is a place, there is a function, there is a position from which God wants to use your life. At the end of the day, the call to the church for us to participate in whatever sphere of politics should be governed by our response to God's call and finding our place to serve him from. We should allow God to shape our, our personalities, to shape our future, and to shape who we are in order for him to reveal himself in our political space. At the end of the day, if you get elected, if, you, if you, any one of you here goes into politics and you become a politician, you become Meshimua, it is not for you. It is for the purposes and the glory of God. One of the great mistakes that the kings of Israel made, those the bad kings, was that they thought that being at the throne was only for their benefit. Because after all, God had made them a chosen nation. But God made them pay the price for their disobedience because they did not honor him and give him the authority and the rule that he should undertake. So tell your neighbor, you have a responsibility to participate. You have a responsibility to pray. You have a responsibility to be patient. And then God can use you in politics. Amen, senior pastor.